Bashira, uh, I am going to, let's see, introduce the next speaker, Bashira Childbury. She is a research associate, associate with the Mississippi State University and is going to be talking to us about uh, Price's potato bean and, and bee, con uh, bee conservation. So let's see, is Bashira on here? So um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, and hopefully y'all can see it. Let's see if that can work. I'm not sure if that. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first of all, I want to say a big thank you to Tara for, um, you know, inviting us, um, I work with a lot of folks on pollination ecology of Apius Priciana, and I appreciate the time that um, you all are giving today in this symposium to the conservation of Apius Priciana and, and finding a place for bees within conservation um, of this federally listed plant. Um, and um, just as a quick note, um, I did not forget photo credits in any of my photos. They, I took them all, <laughs> so I just didn't add the credit to it. Um, but as a start, um, y'all all already know APS Priciana. Uh, Tara's already just talked about it. Um, you know it as a federally listed and threatened species. Um, but it is also a culturally important plant for the Chickasaw Nation. And the Chickasaw Nation, part of their homeland, does enter into Kentucky. Um, and on the right of your screen, um, this is actually APS Priciana at the Common Gardens at the Chickasaw Preserve. Um, so they have a series of preserves and they have APS Priciana on their preserves. Um, and to give you a little bit more context into the conservation, because we do our work okay. within that context, um, I am certain everybody is familiar with APS Priciana at Land Between the Lakes. Uh, I'm definitely sure the um, Kentucky botanists, uh, Tara and Devin, and I've actually done some of these counts with Devin, um, are very familiar with these populations. Um, so we work quite closely uh, with Land Between the Lakes, especially Elizabeth um, Reikis. Um, and I'm sure you are also aware of that she um, and her team very carefully manage um, these populations uh, based on two decades of censuses on vines, flowers, and fruits. And I'm sure many of you have participated in these censuses. Um, but you may be less familiar with what the Chickasaw Nation is doing. So the Chickasaw Nation, based out of Mississippi, um, has common gardens and outplantings um, within their preserve network. Um, they collect seeds across the range from a lot of unprotected sites. So that's the key is they're getting, they're getting to these populations that have absolutely no protection and saving the sternplasm and then growing them in common gardens. And on the right, um, you see John Franklin's hand. Um, he is the historic site coordinator and he runs their APS Priciana conservation program. Um, and he's showing you um, some of the tubers that are produced after a first year plant. So um, together, um, these two folks, or these two groups uh, are working together to identify where to acquire land or where to organize easements. And then also they're, also, they're also interested in writing a manual to manage populations in a given location. So I know you're all thinking, what on earth does this have to do with pollination? So um, pollinators are important, and we put our work in the context of ongoing conservation work. So it's one of the reasons why we work so closely with LBL and the Chickasaw Nation. They're so active in the conservation of APS Priciana. And so we want to make sure that any work that we do in pollination ecology serves the conservation of the species and those stakeholders that are actively involved in it. Um, and so the first, we have to ask ourselves a couple questions. Um, and I know I'm going to be flipping the order on you guys. Um, the very first question you have to ask is, how do pollinators actually contribute to population growth? And then you ask who pollinates, because sometimes pollination and seed production might not be that critical life history stage. And you all don't have a lot of resources for conservation, and you've got to spend it where it's going to have the most impact, 
which is on those critical life history stages. So for us in pollen on the pollination side, we've got to show or at least understand how does it actually contribute to population growth. Then second, we've got to figure out who's actually pollinating and how do they do it. And then finally, um, we've got to figure out where does it fit within the ongoing plans for recovery. So first off, um, I know there's a lot of arrows on here, um, but uh, we've got to figure out where pollinators fit within the life history of these plants. Um, and so this is for those who are familiar with plant demography, um, you know, you'll know, you kind of see we're, we're using a stage-based model here where a lot of these things are familiar. It goes from seed to seedling to juvenile. And then apios can do a couple of different things. Um, it can produce flowers. Um, it can be sexually reproducing. Um, it can be vegetatively propagating itself through tubers or it can just hang out and it can move between these different states. And of course, if it's sexually reproducing, it can produce seed. And what we do know is that, uh, first of all, this is something that John found out at the Chickasaw um, Preserves is that first year seedlings actually do grow into reproductively successful adults. Both seeds and tubers are produced. So a first year, you plant that seed within the first year, you will actually get both a um, flower and a tuber. Um, and then, you know, also, he also found the seeds germinate readily. And I think that's also something that the Missouri Botanical Garden has found. Um, and all of these photos were taken from Chickasaw plants. So this is all, actually, all of these photos are from first year plants, um, which is kind of neat. Um, and when we try to figure out where pollinators fit, um, and I'm sorry, this is a terrible graph. Um, but we didn't find a clear relationship between flowers and seeds, um, which suggests there's a little bit more going on than just pollinators. But it's not that pollinators aren't important. So to make sense of this graph, um, on the um, x-axis is just the total number of flowers. So it's just counting the number of flowers. And then the y-axis is the number of seed pods produced. And you know, we like to try to understand what kind of relationship there is, and we didn't necessarily see any relationship. It's hard to fit any line, whether it's a curve or anything to this. Um, and of course, um, you know, it'll take a little bit more time to understand this. Um, plants change from year to year, but overall, there's no clear, clear relationship between um, flowers and seed. Um, so we know it's not just pollinators, but we can't exclude pollinators contributing to this story. So um, now kind of moving on to who pollinates. Um, there's a lot of data already that supports bees as pollinators. Um, we've seen bees as pollinators. This is Bombus pensylvanicus visiting Apios chrysiana. Um, and um, Apios to be pollinated, um, you really need a bee to press something. So uh, all apios flowers, whether it's Priceyon or Americana, have this keel flower, this keel shape. Um, and this is a very stereotypical um, sort of system in pollination ecology. And honestly, the bees press here and then out pops a stigma and out pops anthers. And it's this explosive pollen um, ball that comes at you. Um, when we have been working with apios, we are usually covered in yellow. Um, and so a bee just has to like press this little keel right here, and then you'll have access to that pollen and to that stigma. Um, and so we have an understanding it's bees. What we did not expect to find um, was that flower size varies a lot. So uh, what all this busyness of this table is trying to show is really over here, um, at this coefficient of variation, which just tells you how much variability there is in flower size. And it's a lot. This is not very common. Um, and so it suggests that you could actually have a lot of different bees pressing that keel. Um, also, um, sort of hinting that flower size varies a lot. Um, when you look at Priciana, you see these gorgeous inflorescences. Um, and there's no clear, again, there's no clear relationship between 
the size of the inflorescence, which we measured as inflorescence length, and the number of flowers. So you could have really small inflorescences that have a bunch of flowers, which also suggests a lot of small flowers. Um, and you could have really, really large inflorescences over here, which also have very few flowers, and they also are giant flowers on there. So you have a lot of variability in this system. And the takeaway that that we can we see is that it's probably likely a lot of different bees can pollinate Apios Priciana. And the key is in how they pollinate. And so that's one of the next steps that we're, we hope to explore soon. Um, and then sort of the last big question is where does all of this fit within Apios recovery? Um, so, you know, the first, you know, we started off first with um, how and how does it, how do pollinators even contribute? And it's not clear cut, but there is some contribution that pollinators are making. You can't get seeds without it, but it's not the whole reason that you get seeds. And the second part is that there are a lot of different bees that likely can pollinate Apios priciana. It's probably not a specialist, which is also pretty common in pollination ecology. Not that many plants specialize. Um, and so we're trying to figure out where does this fit in? And so the next big step that Elizabeth and John are taking is they plan to build a habitat model. Um, and there are many folks on this in this meeting today that have built many HSMs. So they are trying to build an HSM for APS Priciana, figure out where it can go and how do you manage it within a site using the data that they have gathered over long periods of time. Elizabeth's censuses have been two decades long. Um, John has been doing this work since 2016. Now, given that they're building this model, we are trying to understand how do we build pollinators into their model? So our next steps are, we are gonna actually compare pollination efficiencies of all these different floral visitors. APS gets lots and lots of different kinds of bees, actually. Everything from bumblebees to leaf cutters to helictids. Um, to carpenters that aren't always robbing them. Um, and we want to figure out who's actually a good pollinator based on flower size and inflorescent size, and how do they actually contribute to seed set. Next, we've got to build a habitat model for whoever the really good pollinators. So we plan to build a complementary model to their habitat model just for the pollinators. So they know where there's overlap with the most effective pollinators. Um, and then we also hope to use this model to estimate pollinator reliability so they know, okay, regardless, I've got my pollinators around, or I might need to take X, Y, and Z actions to protect my pollinators. Um, and so finally, I just want to give a huge acknowledgement to four people. Um, I We wouldn't have any of those graphs. We wouldn't be able to say anything without these four people. Um, many of you know Elizabeth Reikes. She's the wildlife biologist at LBL. Um, she has helped with a lot of this work. Um, John Franklin has set up the common gardens so we can actually measure a lot of the contribution to of pollinators to the life history. Um, Catherine Grossman Vicente, who is actually going to be a future master's student in bee conservation at Auburn, um, she did a lot of the field work with me. And then Matthew Paik, who is a recent graduate at Auburn, he helped to set the stage and actually get us closer towards building a critical habitat model. Um, and with that, um, you know, I just want to say thank you for giving APOS the time. And I'm pretty sure Elizabeth and John are also in this call, so they can also share more about what they're doing. Um, and again, thank you so much. I appreciate the time you've given to APOS.